All right, uh, well, welcome everyone and welcome Francisco um, to the talk. Um, I'm Peter, I'm just subbing in for Hannes since he's at a workshop today. Um, but nonetheless, we're all excited to, to hear what you you know have to present for us. And if you wanna give an intro first, and then we can get into the uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm Francisco, uh, I'm a final year PhD student uh, based in Cambridge, UK. Um, so I'm working on topics relating to like a bit of the interface between, I guess, uh, entropic optimal transport and uh, diffusion models. And the talk will be um, around that, but focused more on the application of uh, sampling uh, instead of generative modeling. So should I share? Um, yes, now? yes, please. Uh, so first we're gonna like look at some slides one of my colleagues made, uh, but maybe just the first four slides and then we'll just go through the paper and, and read it. Sure just to set up the problem. Let me try and see if I can share. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, let me share this. Let's try. Okay. Oh, sorry, that's wrong share. Uh, okay. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, so this works a uh, collaboration uh, with Nick, uh, Shreyas, and Dennis. Um, and first, we're just gonna kind of set up like uh, the, the the problem that we we, we set out to solve uh, in practice uh, to some level. So um, the goal really is uh, to sample from an unnormalized density, right? So you've got an unnormalized density pi. Uh, where you can evaluate it point wise. So you can evaluate, you know, this function here, v, the potential, and you can also evaluate its derivatives uh, point wise. As for the normalizing constant or the partition function, um, it's not something you have access to. So, you know, the standard approach that uh, we're familiar with is, or we may be familiar with, is just Langevin dynamics, right? But we just kind of follow the gradient of um, the log of this, the gradient of the log target. And this will, you know, converge uh, given a sufficient amount of steps, right? And uh, yeah, so that's effectively here. You know, it takes it takes quite a lot, uh, a long amount of time. It's a, it's an ergodic process for it to converge. Right? It only converges in the limit. Um, another approach, right, is to try and fix a curve of distributions such that, you know, the, the pi zero, like the starting distribution, we can call it a prior. Um, is something very easy, like a Gaussian. And then uh, pi one at the end of this uh, sequence is something that we're, we're interested in. In this case, the, the thing we want to sample from, so e to the minus v uh, normalized. And what we want to achieve is we want to figure out an SDE of this form here, where it looks like Langevin dynamics almost, so it has the, the energy term here, plus some control, which we want to learn. And we'll, we'll talk more about this later such that you know it reproduces this fixed amount of, of, of interpolating distributions here. Uh, specifying the interpolating distribution is, is something that can be done quite easily, right? So these are all terms that can be evaluated point-wise, um, except for the normalizing constant again. So you know we are able to evaluate this uh, minus grad Vt here. And so a, a lot of our work uh, that, that we'll, we'll go in, into shortly uh, will be on how to you know how to learn this. Uh, interpolating SDE and maybe just a quick mention that it's, it's a little bit like in concept that at a high level it's very similar to flow matching uh, ideas in generative modeling or action matching ideas as you're fixing uh, the flow basically you're fixing the interpolating flow and then you're trying to 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 learn a an SDE or an ODE in our case it's an SDE uh, that uh, reproduces uh, such flow so just to kind of like you know, illustrate uh, some of the problems, right? If we, if we have a, an SD that starts at our target and goes backwards, well, it doesn't necessarily uh, reach uh, the prior, the, the blue here line that we're interested in. Likewise, the other way around, you know, if, if we start at the prior, Langevin dynamics in, in a short amount of time will not necessarily uh, reach the target. We want something that interpolates between the prior and the target. And how, how, how uh, yeah, a lot of the work is how can we recover such a flow? Uh, one thing to highlight, right, is that, oh, sorry, uh, that flow is not unique, right? So this is this image here, right? 
this flow is not unique because um, you know there are a lot of different uh, flows that go in between uh, my source and my target distribution. So this is why we want to you know specify you know a series of interpolating flows and, and learn something that that is unique. So now I'm gonna move on to the actual paper uh, after like you know I guess setting up the, the stage. Okay, so um, this paper is currently under review. Uh, there's a version on archive, but this is the, a more up-to-date version than that. Hopefully we'll update quite soon. Um, so there's two contributions uh, to this work. Um, I guess one of the main contributions is that we kind of propose a framework, a generalized framework for just, you know, finding interpolating distributions or just, you know, bridging to source and target distributions, right? Um, People are familiar with Schrodinger bridges. It's very closely related to that as well. But let's um, let's get started, right? So um, our setup is like for the framework. Our setup is we have a source distribution or target distribution. Uh, in our case, this becomes a target action. We've got a distribution new that we can sample. That suppose we can sample from that distribution, and then let's say we specify. Uh, it's just like this is your traditional VAE setup, more or less, right? You can specify a decoder in this case that you know generates an X condition on the sample set. And then you know what we what we would like to do for a lot of different problems is we would like to transport this set from this distribution to uh, a marginal distribution mu here in equation two. So we can write the marginal for our uh, the process that the generative process that we've written in equation one and we would like it this equality to again just you know be enforced right and as is quite common in, in vi we also write you know the the reverse process right so you know imagine we sample x from mu in, in the case of generative modeling this might be sampling x from the data distribution and then we have our uh, encoder passing that to z and so really an, another way of you know of enforcing two is we want to enforce this equality here in equation four right so this gives us a coupling if we can enforce this relationship between the encoder and the decoder subject to the source and the target distributions mu and new, then you know, just by taking marginals on both sides, you'll see that this is enforced and likewise for new, uh, it'll be the, the Z marginal. Another, so this, this leads us to our, our framework one, basically. So if, if we specify a, a divergence, which we know is uh, only zero if these, this equality above holds, then, um, oops, sorry, it's clicked then um, you know, our goal is to basically, okay, whenever that divergence is zero, then we have you know, that our, our model has, or our, our bridging distributions have achieved a coupling, right? So this is, a, this is our framework one, right? And um, yeah, and the, the, the kind of one thing to, to highlight about this is what we said already is that there's actually many choices of P theta and Q theta of encoders and decoders or these forwards and backwards transition densities that will bring this to zero. So the problem is, is really not unique. Um, the thing that we focus the most on this paper is the sampling problem. So in the case of the sampling problem, new is a target density that you know, we want to sample from that we can evaluate point-wise like we just uh, detailed in the slides. Uh, it's converse to generative modeling. In generative modeling, the target is actually uh, mu, which we have samples available from. Uh, but this generalized framework, you know, it's it's it works for both, right? So if you if you if your goal is generative modeling, you're you're trying to estimate mu. If your goal is sampling, you're trying to estimate mu. And that, the reason that is is because typically most divergences take expectations with respect to what you have on the left hand side. So you need samples available from mu. So to extend this framework further, we need to you know be able to parameterize Q and P as flexible enough distributions, right? So again, we we just take the kind of approach that's been done before in VAE literature, which is these hierarchical VAEs, right? So hierarchical VAEs is just a series of, of transition densities uh, instead of just having a, a static marginal that jumps from X to Z, we have all these intermediate latents for both the encoder and decoder distributions. And they are specified by simple Gaussian transitions where a neural network is a, a residual neural network, if you look at this, is just simply residual uh, net is applied by the mean, right? And so uh, writing them here, maybe a bit more clearly, so you can see the residual connections. Uh, there's just the residual net plus some noise. Um, 
And then the goal here would be to just, again, as before, you minimize the KL divergence, but rather than a static KL divergence with only two variables, this is a pathwise KL divergence. And it's important to highlight that this is an upper bound on the static KL divergence. So if you bring the upper bound to zero, then you have it's true for the static marginals as well. So this fits into framework one, I mean, mostly quite nicely. And um, it's quite, you know, it's, it's, this is, these are not new results. This is more of a lit review up to this point. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's quite clear that if you, you know, if you take the limit of these step sizes delta here uh, in these recurrences going to zero, you're going to get SDs, right? This has been studied quite a bit before. We discussed it a bit more in the appendix. But, you know, for, for one of the networks, you're going to get a forward SD. Not for one of the networks, for one of the transition densities, uh, you will get a forward SD. So that's for the uh, encoder density. And then for the other, you'll get a backwards SD, depending how you, you set things up, right? The, the choice of forward and backwards is uh, up to setup, really. And so we can, you know, we can extend this framework to the SD setting or to the path, pathwise setting, uh, we call it in this work. Um, and all we really need now is to be able to take KL divergences between SDs going forward in times and SDs going backwards in times. And this has been looked at a little bit, um, specifically like within like a Schrodinger bridge literature uh, in within ML. Um, they've been trying to you know rearrange um, basically run Nikodem derivatives of two forward SDs, but what happens when you flip the drift using Nelson's relation and things like that. So what we do here is a little bit more general than that because uh, you know, we find a general expression for the round equilibrium derivative for just forwards and backwards SDs um, without you know, applying Nelson's relation directly. And from these, this particular expression, you can derive a lot of the other expressions that have been discussed um, within the literature. So once we have this, right, we already have access to um, an extension of framework one, right? So framework one, again, was like, let's minimize these divergences to get a coupling. Um, as soon as you have the ratio between the two distributions, you can compute most divergences. For example, KL divergence, you just need to take an expectation up to you know, some sign here. So this is one of our main results is just this general uh, uh, proposition, which allows you to find the you know, density ratio of random Nikodem derivative between a forward and a backwards SD. Um, yeah, so just a little context here. This remark three is, you know, how do you discretize the backwards SD? Again, if you know, you're more familiar with diffusion models, you will have seen these expressions before. It's not computationally expensive to discretize a backwards SD. You know, you're just evaluating the time steps at a different point effectively. So it's, it's this is quite cheap. Uh, previous works that have found expressions for, for this, quantity in position 2.2, usually use this uh, evaluation uh, for the backwards SD. And as a result, they end up with divergences popping up, which again, are, are not hugely expensive, but aren't so cheap either. You have to use Hutchinson's trace estimator among other things. So again, this leads us to the main framework uh, that we propose in this work, which is that you, know, you minimize the KL divergence between two SDs. One SD starts at mu and another SD starts at nu. And you know, when this is minimized, then we have found a, a bridge, so to say, between nu and mu. As we kind of highlighted before, um, this is not unique in the sense that there are tons of minimizers. There are many different SDEs that can you know, minimize this quantity. And some of them might have more unstable or harder to, to learn drifts than other. So in what follows uh, of the paper, we're really studying like how, how can we make this objective uh, unique, uh, maybe a bit more practical. Um, and here we cover a little bit of what's already been done. So actually score-based generative modeling really is the case. So you can derive most uh, DDPM score-based generative model kind of papers uh, by just setting the divergence to KL and fixing one of these processes. So fixing the uh, the one that you're taking expectations with respect to, the one that starts at mu. So let mu be your data distribution and you fix this to like, for example, a VPSD. And you play around a little bit with this objective. So we prove this and you can arrive at most uh, different score matching losses, implicit score matching losses. All of this can fall out just by fixing uh, the, the first distribution in the first argument of this scale divergence and learning the other one. You will recover more score matching losses. 
If you do it the other way around, if you fix the one that starts from new and make new be a, an energy that you want to sample from an unnormalized density, then you'll recover a lot of modern approaches uh, for sampling from unnormalized densities using diffusion models. Uh, so it's a quite nice duality, you know, depending on what you fix, you'll recover sampling methods or generative modeling methods, uh, quite simple, quite straightforward. And if you don't use VPSDE, if you use these other methods called first hitting diffusions or polymer drift to transforms, you recover a, a different array of methods uh, that'd be used for both generative modeling and sampling. So this is, the, I guess, the framework part, right? Um, so what's common in all these approaches, though, is that they um, they learn one or the other, right? So they fix a drift on one side. So they, they don't learn both the forward and the backwards drifts at the same time. They're only either learning forward drifts or only learning backwards drifts. So something that might be more advantageous is trying to learn both at the same time. Uh, Methodologies like action matching can somewhat have that interpretation. And, and here we propose, I guess, a close variant of that, but for sampling um, that learns both. So as we discussed before, if you just optimize both of these A and Bs, there are many solutions to that uh, objective. And so that's, you know, it's not really viable. You can end up learning things that behave very strangely. You know, even if you find a bridge, it might be hard to learn. Uh, so what we want to do is start up with an objective that is, you know, well specified uh, to begin with, and um, you know, to discuss that we go back to like uh, I guess entropic optimal transport, because entropic optimal transport finds you a coupling between mu and mu or whatever the distributions you're working with, but it's it's a unique coupling uh, subject to some definition, and it's um, typically well defined. It's it's optimal in some sense. It's simple in some sense, right? So in this case, when we, we talk about entropic optimal transport, we're really looking at the path version of it, which is just Schrodinger bridges, right? So these problems, the, the, the way they act is I, you know, I want to find a coupling between mu and nu, but I want my SDE to be close to some reference SDE. That's what makes it simple. So for example, I can make the reference SDE like a BPSDE and OU process. Um, or I can make it be a Brownian motion, and this leads to different types of uh, approaches, uh, different types of Schrodinger bridges. The point of it is that it makes the objective unique. Um, unfortunately, the algorithms for solving SVPs, and this has evolved quite a bit, there's nicer algorithms developed uh, quite recently, like in the last two months, but the classic algorithms for solving Schrodinger bridges require an alternating two operations, uh, actually modern ones too. <laughs> um, the, the operations change, of course, but the, the classical operations are basically you solve bridges subject to only one constraint, right? So uh, you alternate problems. You start by, okay, I only impose a constraint on the source distribution, mu. I only impose a constraint on the target distribution. You alternate these sequences of problems. If you're using neural networks to solve each of these problems, then you're accumulating errors and you know, it can have lots of issues. In practice, it's slow solving so many optimization problems in sequence. Uh, for some context, these objectives are, they just actually just boil down to score matching objectives, more or less. So it's just alternating score matching objectives, but in different directions, if you want to think of it that way. But it's nice that, um, you know, that at least it has some guarantees, it has some convergence guarantees um, to further connect this a little bit more to our framework, because it's connected to, to these objectives in 17, which are not really related to this scale divergence framework we propose. Uh, we're actually able to show that one does coordinate ascent on our framework one objective, so the scale divergence between forwards and backwards processes, then you can recover, um, that's just the EM algorithm doing coordinate ascent on these types of objectives. So if you do the EM algorithm in a, in a framework, you can recover the same updates as IPF. So this is a new result, um, and this provides a new connection between you know, expectation maximization and IPF within these types of sampling slash genetic modeling uh, contexts. Again, this doesn't help us too much in the practical sense, uh, because this is still, you know, it's still an objective that alternates a sequence of operations. They still accumulate errors. So we're not quite there yet, um, but we have discussed, you know, other ways of making the uniqueness. So instead we, what we do here to, to enforce the uniqueness is what we started discussing with above. Uh, at the start, we fix a series of flows that go between our source and target distributions. And again, it's it's when you're when you're in the context of sampling, it's quite straightforward to to specify these interpolating flows. Um, 
And then our goal is effectively to find an SD, which has as its marginal distribution, this series of interpolating flows. And we're, that we're able to learn by just you know, minimizing a KL divergence. So what we showed is that if we parameterize this SD in this particular way, where we have in a way just, you know, just your traditional Langevin dynamics, plus a control that you want to learn, then you know, if, 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 if you assume, if you think about for a second, imagine that this, um, this did have the, the interpolating marginals that you were after, then its reversal would look um, exactly the same, but with a minus on this term, just by Nelson's rule. So, you know, you might jump right away and say, okay, what if I minimize the KL divergence between a forward SDE, such as the one in 21, and one with the sign flipped on the Langevin term, because that would be its reversal if it did reproduce the interpolating marginals. Um, and so that's, that's how we, you know, intuitively at, at first we arrive at our objective. We're able to prove, in fact, that when this is, when this is minimized, uh, proposition 3.2, you do in fact recover uh, the interpolating marginal and it is unique up to some, you know, super simple uh, constant scalings, uh, additive ones actually. Um, so again, we are, if you minimize this objective here, you're going to learn an equation 21 that goes between your source and target distributions. And furthermore, it's low at every point in time is, is fixed to something you pre-specified, right? So this is a bit of a different flavor to the other approaches we discussed that fix either the forward or the backwards process, here you're just fixing the marginal, the interpolating marginal, and you're learning both the forward and the backwards SDE at the same time. Because notice phi appears in both forward and backwards processes. And that can have quite a few advantages for sampling uh, because you're, by learning the forward SDE, you're learning a better sampler, uh, but by learning both, you're actually obtaining you know, a tighter elbow, so you get better Allen set estimators. Uh, um, this yeah. Simulation of two SDs during training? No, only one. So you only need to simulate uh, uh, the, this one, the forward one, the equation 21. Yeah. I see. Right, so, so, and the other question is <clears throat> uh, I, I'm not sure if you are aware of like diffusion normalizing flow paper or those papers that try to parameterize the forward SD, the drift of the forward SD, and minimize yeah. the KLD between forward and leapers. So I'm just wondering yeah. the difference. Between so, the future, so, the, so we discussed diffusion normalizing flow. So the problem with, uh, well, you know, you can decide if it's a problem or not <laughs> based on what we've chatted. The diffusion normalizing flow paper minimizes exactly this objective, 22. Um, wait, let's go, there's a more general one. So the diffusion normalizing flow paper minimizes I'm looking for framework one, give me one second. So yeah, the, the diffusion normalizing flow paper minimizes this objective here in framework one. So you have the KL divergence between a forward SD and a backwards SD. The paper does parameterize the backwards SD in a way such that the drift of the forward one is inside there as well. But the paper completely learns two separate drifts. You know, one is for the forward SD and one has a term. There's two separate networks being learned. Um, there are no constraints there in, in the sense that, you know, the, you can, the, the object, it's, it's the same as this objective virtually. And we, we do, you know, do some discretizations in the appendix and connect to uh, the continuous normalizing flow paper, um, but it, it's not unique. Okay, so that's the, the first thing to say about the, the CNF objective is that, you know, depending on it, and actually we do a small ablation, it can behave a little bit unstable. Um, depending on initialization, you can end up in different places. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't fall into these transport paradigms where, where you have uniqueness. The other thing to discuss is they don't work in continuous space um, for the KL divergences. So they don't have the theory around the SDE aspect. They just discretize the SDEs first, and then they go about trying to compute the scale divergence. Uh, what we do here is it's a little bit different. We derive the KL divergence in, let's say, continuous time, so to say, and a bit more than just the KL divergence. We drive the R&D. So this gives you access to many different loss functions. Um, and, you know, we can show that diffusion normalizing flow is just a specific discretization of this R&D, in fact, um, and use KL, and then you can arrive at diffusion normalizing flow. But yeah, it's, it's very close. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. So for the regularization, you have 
and entropy regularization here, while diffusion normalized flow didn't use any sort of regularization. That's the one point, right? I guess, yeah, the more important part is we have some form of regularization here. It's not quite an entropy one, but that, that's fine. Okay. Um, and then diffusion normalizing flow does not have any form of regularization. It's just completely unconstrained. Yeah, and the other like difference is the parameterization. So in in your case, like you are only learning one neural network, or we're only learning one neural network exactly yeah. that appears in both the forward and backwards, and that's what actually imposes the constraint or the regularizer. Oh, cool. Yeah, so okay. we figure out a way of doing a parameterization that makes this you know unique, and it and it is related to to entropy constraints in in some limit. Um, but it's it's not quite exactly uh, of an vanilla entropy constraint. Yeah. Cool. Uh, are there any questions? Or we're almost there. Um, okay. So I'll keep I'll keep going and just, just please interject if you have any more questions. Um, so and and that, well, yeah, one of the main things we you know we we want to do with this because it is a sampling paper is we want to compute partition functions. So once you you know once you have trained this model. Of course, if you trained it perfectly, you have a zero variance influence sampler, which is you know just what you should have, just more of a sanity check more than anything else. And so we can use this expectation here, which again we can approximate empirically without too much difficulty, to um, estimate the partition function. One thing we noticed, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it's a little bit outside of ML, um, but we're able to connect. Um, I guess our framework, so the, basically the result where we calculate the randomly converted between forward, backwards, and, the, and forwards and backwards SDEs to a celebrated uh, result in uh, statistical mechanics, which is the fluctuation theorem. Uh, so because of uh, Eichler constraints, it's <laughs> very tiny here. So this, this relationship here is called the Jarsinski inequality, and it relates quite a few fundamental quantities in thermodynamics. So for example, work done here, and here, this is a free energy ratio. So it's, it's quite a, a fundamental result. And uh, with our you know, R&D result uh, that we proposed earlier, if you just, you can arrive at this result here, which is Crookes fluctuation theorem. Uh, again, another result from StatMech. And just by taking expectations on both sides, you can reach uh, this result. Why is this result useful? Um, it's used a lot uh, for free energy computations in molecular dynamics, right? So not, not just partition functions, but ratios of partition functions. And, Changes in energy levels, so it does have quite a lot of uh, applications, and um, you know we're able to provide a new proof for it, which is quite succinct, uh, just using probability results uh, out of the bat, simple, simple, very short. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, yeah, so this is what we discussed earlier. So if you you can interpret uh, our parameterization basically as because you know we fix the flow, you can interpret it as an infinitesimal Schrodinger bridge in the sense that you can see that we're solving a Schrodinger bridge with, with Langevin dynamics as the reference process. And at every point in time, we have the constraint that we you know, match the interpolating distribution. And you can actually formalize this limit. And so this is, you know, this is in a way relating this parameterization that we have proposed to an entropic optimal transfer constraint, which is a kind of statement in the previous uh, question. So it is, it is very closely related, uh, but only in, in a limit. Um, this, this here should answer some of the questions as well. So this is the objective that we use in practice. So, you know, this equation 24 here is effectively the same objective that you have in uh, diffusion normalizing flows, but with this special parameterization. And this is for sampling, diffusion normalizing flows for generative modeling. Um, and again, you just need to simulate the forward SDE, compute this ratio, which is quite cheap, and then just back propagate through it. That's the not cheap part. <laughs> Um, there is an alternative of this objective in that you can replace um, this expectation with a variance, and that allows you to detach um, the trajectories. But uh, this is not the focus of our work. There's a, another great paper um, that's um, focused on this, um, this concurrent, quite similar setup uh, by Julius and Lorenz and another in the call. So yeah, so this is the objective we minimize. And using this ratio here, we also plug it into equation 23 to normalizing constants. So again, now here's the the experiments. So what are the experiments? All these. So, uh, one question. Yeah. Um, but like, so like at the beginning, you sort of mentioned like the time being an issue, right? That you have to like only things only converge in the in the time limit for like Langevin dynamics. And do you yeah. 
how does that compare to to here? Yeah. So again, so if we're talking about continuous time, so let's let's focus on continuous time. Discrete time, <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit weaker the argument. So in continuous time, our process, this process here, when you when you learn the optimal phi by minimizing the scale, this process reproduces the distribution pi t, and pi t is defined in a finite time interval from zero to one actually or zero to capital T, or T is just a finite thing. I think we used one, uh, not 100% sure, but yeah. Um, it's a fixed bounded in, uh, flow. So the this thing reaches the target distribution, which is the target distribution is just realized that pi capital T. So this process reaches the, the target distribution in finite time. This is, you can prove this, uh, at least for the continuous time setting. So this is why this is not a, like Langevin dynamics for which capital T actually has to go to infinity, we don't have an error coming from the, the finite T um, constraint or does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfect. Thank you. Yeah. In, in, in kind of more, more simple terms, right? Well, what you really do is you take Langevin dynamics, which is this thing here, and you add an extra term that forces it to converge in finite time. You know, if you look at this KL here, you're minimizing an objective that is, you know, it's only minimized when you hit the distribution at the final time. So you're adding an extra term that you can learn that forces it to, you know, reach the desired result within the, the bounded time interval. Unfortunately, when you discretize, you, you're going to incur into this, you're going to have an Euler uh, Maruyama error anyways. So, you know, both of them only converge as this time step goes to zero, very small. The Langevin dynamics has two sources of error, the time step and the uh, time interval. This only has the time step source of error. Yeah. If you ignore the neural network fitting error, of course. Uh, what about it? Uh, continuous cases? Does it change? Sorry, I couldn't hear it. It came muffled. Could you repeat? Uh, uh, what about in continuous cases? Does does this change? So in the continuous cases, when you have the guarantees in the in the continuous yeah. time case, that was the setting. In the continuous time case, you can reach the target distribution in finite time. That's what we we prove about this proposed approach. It's when you discretize that you incur the Euler error. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, but in the continuous case, this is when everything works perfectly, and, and we have all these nice results. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. So just to explain a little bit, uh, what the, what the target distributions here are. So each of these, these names here, these are, um, most of them come from like Bayesian computation tasks. So these are just, uh, target distributions that we can evaluate. So these are just E to the minus VX examples, right? Um, and the, with the dimensions specified here, um, the largest one is an example from Bayesian inference, this log, uh, Gaussian Cox process, which is. 1,600 dimensions is quite challenging. It's quite high dimensional. And uh, we compare it to a bunch of things. So I guess that the main thing we want to compare to, I mean, not the main thing, but the main baseline that you know, as a sandwich that you really want to be is the ergodic EULA, you know, it's just with the phi set to zero, no control. Um, but we also compare it to second order. Uh, so this UHA here will be like an HMC equivalent of this. And we compare it to another method, uh, Monte Carlo diffusion, which also learns a phi, but only like by fixing, you know, it only learns a backwards process, not a forward ones. And we also compare it to these other methods, um, path integral sampler and denoising diffusion samplers, which uh, are the other way around. They only learn a forward process and not a backwards one. Uh, so we compare it to quite a, a wider, wider range of, of different sampling approaches with some standard baselines, I guess, and C. Um, and we're able to see that our proposed approach uh, quite dramatically uh, outperforms most of them in a partition function estimation or, or just elbow as the estimator of the partition function as well. Um, and we also try to measure uh, sample quality in this case. So in, in the case where we can measure sample quality are, are, are quite limited. Basically, are distributions that we can sample from. Most of these distributions, you just can't sample from them to begin with. So it's hard to measure sample quality. And for this, we just use the kind of sync or divergence, which is maybe not the best thing, but one of the few things that worked reasonably well. And again, there we were able to see that our approaches still uh, outperform quite consistently on sample quality. So yeah, I think I think that's that's roughly uh, the paper in a in a quick nutshell. Um, 
of there. So I guess maybe we can just discuss our, our questions. Um, around that. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll have a, another question here is um, like, for instance, when you're like the whole, one of the motivations is to say that you want to learn uh, to train, you know, the backwards and forwards rather than fix one of them. And maybe that would give you better results. Is there, yeah, any, like, is there any like sort of result on like you being guaranteed a better, like a more optimal solution or something along those lines? No, not necessarily. So yeah, so let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's dissect that a little bit. So I mentioned a couple of other approaches like the path integral sampler, for example, let's, let's focus on that one. Um, somewhere here anyways. So there's, yeah, exactly. So there's these, uh, scores based sampling, this thing we call the former drift or the path integral sampler, this only learns the forward um, approach. And, you know, if you look, if you analyze this in continuous time and you're minimizing over all the space of admissible controls, this has the same guarantees, okay? This will reach the target distribution. This will have, you know, uh, it will be optimal in the variance important sampling sense. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're working like in the, in the pure theoretical basis in continuous time, it's, you know, it's not gonna, there's not like a theoretical argument for learning both is gonna uh, improve results. Um, and I think it's a bit more of an intuitive argument. So another method that we discuss and compared to is called uh, Monte Carlo diffusion. Uh, in their case, they fix Langevin dynamics. So EULA, they just fix it and then they learn the reversal. And that is very helpful to obtain better estimates for the partition function. It lowers the variance. You can prove all these properties about it. Uh, but one downside of, of, of the approach is that you're not actually getting a better sampler, right? You, you're not learning a forward process. By learning a forward process, you learn a sampler. So just by learning the backwards process, all you're doing is learning a nice reweighting to obtain better partition function estimation properties. Um, so yeah, so that, that's one clear example where it's like, okay, just learning the backwards drift is not great. Um, so you want to definitely learn the forward drift. Um, and then, yeah, then the other argument becomes a little bit harder. So, okay, we need to definitely learn the forward drift. Is it good enough to just learn a forward drift? Um, empirically, we find it we found it to work better. Um, but in practice, yeah, I think it's 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 just an intuitive motivation, right? You want to ideally be able to tune both the forward and the backwards process to minimize the elbow much more, and that's what we see in practice. By tuning both, the elbow is just significantly smaller. Um, but uh, yeah, there's not there's not a strong theoretical reason uh, other than optimizing forward and optimizing backwards can give you different benefits. One improves sample quality, the other clearly um, tunes the variance down. So you know you're exploiting both of these things at the same time. That's the best answer I can give. Awesome, thank you. Um, so there is a question in the chat. Did you test the partition function estimation for physical systems? Uh, let me think. I think the answer is no. <laughs> but uh, so the, we have some collaborators who are working on that. Um, it's not our work. I mean, we've just uh, chatted. In. So there's people who are testing this in molecular dynamics and in particular, like settings that you care about, Jarsinski quality type of relationships. Um, and they're, they're seeing better results than, than MCD and then other methods that, that have come out recently around this. So the, there is some work upcoming on that. Um, we ourselves are working on um, alanine dipeptide. Um, that's a bit, bit more simple than what they're doing, than the MD examples are doing. And um, the, 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 the issue there is you, you need to do a, a, quite a little bit more work because there's, there's the problem of mode collapse and other things, which is not something that we focus on addressing in this work. So you need to combine it with some more uh, recent work in uh, sampling with diffusions to, to be able to get that working. But yeah, it's upcoming work, basically. We didn't for this paper, though. Yeah. All right. Uh, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, so so for the forward process, it's, there's hypothetically an underlying uh, potential. It's a, it's as the uh, flowing at finite time. You know, there's no guarantee you interplay to the target distribution you want, right? So. I'm just wondering, so as you train, 
uh, you are learning this like time dependent control term. Yep. Pass towards the target. However, like, during training, like you are not, there's a very good chance that you you never approaching. You know, in the finite time, you are integrating to the target distribution you want, which can induce some kind of bias, right? Is that uh, hopefully that's not a naive question? So my understanding. No, is no, no. That, I mean, it's what what you're saying is a correct statement. Like that, that there's okay. always going to be the bias, right? So but I mean, you, you have quality to crack for the bias. Is that my understanding? So the reweighting, you can always reweight with the work done. So that you yes, can, so you can do that exactly. So if, if if you want to do partition function estimation, you can tackle that bias by doing the reweighting. Yeah. But does can you also re apply that reweighting to the training objective, just in case you know as you flow, you never approach the target, you know, correct target distribution in finite time. Uh, so if, if you if you apply that reweighting to to KL. Um, you're going to end up with a cross entropy or a forward KL divergence, basically, um, if you work it out. Um, it's it's not a really nice objective to minimize if you do the reweighting because you're going to have an exponential term and then like a Gersanov term inside. So it's not it's not a nice. Term. So this this reweighting is nice when you've already learned a proposal that is good that you know that has low variance ideally, but. Um, if you do this reweighting very early in training, you're going to end up with something that quite often gives you zeros and maybe too often. Um, so it has some practical issues doing this reweighting in training. But that's the main thing I would say. Even if it's nice conceptually, um, it does have quite a few practical issues um, doing that. Yeah. Got it. Uh, thanks. That's Thank you. Yeah, you're right. That this is always there. And yeah, we don't necessarily overcome it. Um, you know, you can make t smaller and smaller. Uh, so by that I mean delta t. The smaller you make delta t, you're you're bringing some of those biases down. But um, there's also going to be other sources. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I think another thing uh, just came up. Uh, can you comment on the convergence properties? You know, for example, con you know, for you know, log concave case, can you does this like additional control term give you better convergence than EULA or something? Um, um, I don't. So I don't think so. Right. So, so you can't prove. Okay. So it depends what what, what assumptions you make, right? So, if your work, if you assume you have, um, if you assume you have a grad phi star, you can prove some things, right? <laughs> because you have the optimum thing. Um, yeah, that being the optimal case. I mean, if yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you you're gonna you're gonna drop one of the error terms from Eula. Right. So, so the, in, in the log concave setting, like the, the error in EULA depends on, you know, both the size of the steps you're taking and maybe the, the, the sum or so the, the, the time interval, the capital T in this case, and you will drop the error term on the capital T, for example. So you won't have that ergodicity error in the, in the bounds showing up. If you assume you have the optimal phi star, that will be the case. So, you, you know, you do incur, um, a slightly better loss, but at the same time, the, from what I remember, I haven't looked at these bounds in a while, but from what I remember, the biggest bottleneck in these bounds, like you, you still have like a square root of DT term, right? That's, that might be one of the leading terms in these bounds anyways, or a square root delta term. Um, and, you know, you're still going to have that here. That's not going to improve because that just comes from discretizing the SDE with Euler. Um, so, yeah, you, you will have one term less in the... In the convergence bounds, but it's still the leading square root DD term is going to be of the same order. That's not going to be brought down by this. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Very cool work. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Uh, what is the discretization error in the equation before equation 15 in remark three? Uh, and it's connection to equation 15. So maybe we can go to that. Okay. So there's two questions. That's the first one. I guess, uh, let me look, equation 15. So the discretization error in this equa in the equation, right? Um, between these two. So you're still gonna, so I mean, we don't use equation 15. Uh, we use the ones above, right, in, in our work. Uh, this is just a 
to connect it to other works, we we show equation 15, but the, the actual discretizations are these ones. Yeah, so I think the, the question is about that. Yeah, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the bits. Yeah, so in terms of equation 15, I'll, I'll go back to the other two, of course. In terms of equation 15, it's discretization error is still going to be an Euler type of error. Uh, so you can prove the exact same uh, types of error for both for forwards and backwards discretization. Same applies to the backwards ETO integral uh, up here. Um, and then we have a different question in the equation of equation three. And oh, well, it's relationship to remark three, sorry. Uh, let's see. Remark two, remark one. Wait, let me just control F it. I think it was just above. Yeah. Oh, that is remark three, sorry. Uh, I don't know how I missed that. Uh, what is this? Remark three. Um, no, no, the question was about error of the equation before equation 15. Yeah, yeah. So that, that still incurs an Euler error. And these are the ones that we use to, so by other, I mean square root AT error. Okay, it's only the discretization error, is not a other type of. Uh... There's not another. And if you use 15, uh, this second term here in 15, if you use 15 instead, so this is, this is the. The point of remark three to some extent. If you instead fifteen has been what's been used before. Uh, if you use fifteen instead, you have this uh, divergence cost here, which is quite horrible if you do it by auto diff. Um, and instead of doing it by auto diff, what people typically do is they use a stochastic estimator for the trace. And so the equation fifteen incurs an extra error, not just the Euler error coming from discretizing these integrals, uh, but also a uh, Hutchinson's trace estimator error. Uh, whilst these equations here, yeah, do not have that. Yeah. Thank you. And now equation 24, let's have a quick look. Um, so equation 24 is... Uh, maybe it's not this one, the zeta, the partition function, uh, the, maybe the number are... are 23? Yeah, 23, yes, thank you. Sorry, yeah, the archive paper is different. I'm sorry about yeah. that. Uh, uh, so, okay, so let's look at let's look at the, uh, at equation 23. Um, so you have the ratio between the forwards and the backwards SDEs, right? And so we have a we have a way to compute that. If you use, you know, if you, if you go from proposition, I mean, let me scroll down to the proposition. Sorry, it's just really far down in the appendix. So if you use that remark three plus our main proposition on Grassano theorem, um, you basically arrive at the, the kind of same discretization they have in continuous normalizing flows, um, which I would love to show it. Uh, let's see, CMCD experiments, I showed you before that. It, uh, so yeah, it exactly. computed, is it computed uh, as the ratio of the two integral? Or, um... How do you compute it? it? It boils down to this, right? So the 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 log of the R and D, you, you know, we can we can show that it's this. You know, you're gonna have a forward integral, you're gonna have a backwards integral. You have some time integrals here. We know very well how to discretize forward integrals thanks to remark three. We can also discretize the backwards integrals. I'm flipping them. Sorry, when I'm um, describing them. And then what happens in the end is that, you know, it, it, everything simplifies down to what you see here, right? So it's, it's, it's quite a simple expression, which um, ultimately, uh, so the question 67 here, I guess it's more expanded version of the expression. Ultimately, this is just the ratio between two Gaussians, you know, one Gaussian, one, two Gaussian Markov chains. I mean, so one Gaussian Markov chain being the forward discretization of the forward SDE, the other Gaussian Markov chain being the discretization of the backwards SDE. And that's what you see um, inside the objective. So, nope, I keep missing it. So this is our objective equation 24. This term inside here, that's that, that ratio, that's that log uh, R and D. That's what it turns out being the one I just showed you. It's just, you know, on one side you have the the forward transition density on the other, you have the backwards transition density is just the ratio. It really is just the ratio you expect when you discretize the two things. 
that's what it comes down to. And for estimating the partition function, we just, this is the R&D. So where you see this thing here, you know, you replace that here in this expectation. You plug that into here. So it just, you flip it because the partition function has one over. Um, but basically the expectation without the log and then to the power of minus one inside the expectation is what we use to estimate the partition function. So, you know, just remove this log, reciprocate. That's our estimator for the partition function and it's unbiased. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, the only error is the discretization error of the integral, correct? Yeah, because of the importance sampling, because it's, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. So even if you have an error in uh, in phi, because you learned that that doesn't actually play into the IS error. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. But also important to highlight because you are you are indeed doing important sampling. There is actually no bias at all here. So if you take the expectation of the error, it is actually zero because you're doing IS. Um, you know, in practice, you will incur error from the samples, of course. Yeah, you... Rob. Um, yeah. So, is the controlled crooks is that new? And then we get standard crooks in Jerzynski for phi equals zero. Yeah, the controlled right. crooks is new. Yeah, that's right. So the this version of crooks with this CT term here, that's new. Um, and then just setting that term to zero gives you the standard crooks and the standard Jerzynski. Um, we haven't thought much about the controlled crooks. You know, it's new, but is it actually interesting? Um, and I guess the other thing is that this proof for crooks only uses results with R&Ds, right? And it doesn't, if you look at other derivations for Jarsinski equality um, for SDEs, they typically use a lot of PDE results, Feynman cats, and, you know, this, if you assume that you already know the, the, the ratio of the RNG between two SDs, which is quite intuitive, the result, I think, <laughs> once you remove the reference process, of course. Um, this is like a three liner. You just apply Ito's lemma and you rearrange some terms and you get Crook's identity. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what we thought was interesting about this. It's a simpler proof for Crook's, and indeed the controlled version is new. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. And then, um, do you use the relation between EAM and IPF at all? Like for. <laughs> <laughs> it seems you have, it seems you have nice motivation for the EM or the order of KL that you use, and then that's also the KL for Schrodinger bridge. So yeah, no, we, we don't explore. That. Yeah, that's right. We don't we don't really explore that empirically. We don't use it at all. Um, I guess the, the storyline goes, you know, you know, how would you achieve uniqueness? One way is IPF, and that's related to a framework through EM, and then. I guess we criticize EM a little bit in the sense that it's not necessarily a valid criticism, but if you were to use EM for this task or for generative modeling, you'd still have to solve many problems sequentially. Um, and you know that's just maybe a little bit tedious solving many arguments. You, know, you have an extra outer loop on your training and instead another way you can go ahead and, and guarantee this uniqueness is by just fixing the interpolating dist. Um, so that's kind of how the story goes, but we don't really do any empirics uh, for the EM. Uh, we do have some general modeling experiments where, uh, you know, we do we do um, these uh, path regularizers, these Schrodinger bridge-based regularizers, but, um, you know, those are just ablations there to just talk about the framework. Uh, the main experiments are the sampling ones, which, yeah, as you said, they don't really touch uh, the EM results much at all. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, what was the hardware used uh, for the ex experiments? Uh, A100. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, the one with 80 gigabytes of RAM. Because there's two. There's a smaller one. So the larger A100. Uh, okay. The 80 gig one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, the, the experiments are quite memory intensive. Um, because un unlike diffusion, unlike the generative setting in diffusion models where you, your trajectories are detached, in sampling your trajectories do carry gradients mm -hmm. unless you do some clever tricks, um, which we don't explore much. Yeah. Cool.
I want to uh, just kind of link. So quite, quite a few people have been asking about memory stuff. So I want to link this other work in the chat. Um, so this is concurrent work uh, came out the same time as ours. It's got a similar setup, um, but they come up with a log variance divergence for sampling, which allows to overcome this memory bottleneck that I keep mentioning. So I just linked that in the chat. Also, I'll also include it in the um, sort of the schedule, you know, the paper is post on Slack. Uh, sorry, can you put that? Uh, I'll just include it in the Slack channel as well. Oh, no, I can send it there. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, sorry to clarify, did you say they don't back propagate through trajectories? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if not, point... if not, how do they get away with it? Or like, is there some other downside? Yeah, so, so there's been previous work. So like if you, so it's, they use a different divergence, right? Um, they don't use the KL divergence, they use the log variance divergence. Um, the log variance divergence, the expectations in the variance uh, for the log variance divergence, you can take with respect to any measure. It doesn't have to be the Q and P that you're trying to match, right? So you do VAR with respect to some intermediate distribution U and then LN, inside the expectation LNQP uh, as usual. Um, but that U can be anything. It doesn't, you know, you can show that this is minimized for any U, you'll have that Q equals P. That, that's a property of the variance basically. Um, and because of that, you can just make U equals to the thing you're optimizing. In this case, let's say it's Q, but detached, right? Um, or you can think of it as Q in the previous step. And so that's, that's effectively, I mean, it's oversimplified how I'm saying it, but that's effectively what they do. Um, it's well justified and yeah, you don't have the, the trajectories attached anymore. It works quite well. I mean, I've, I've, we've explored a little bit in our appendix as well. Um, it works quite well up to like moderate dimensional things. So like a hundred dimensions and such, uh, maybe 200, I haven't gone that far. I think if you start to go, you know, very high, like the log Cox process, it gets a little bit harder if you don't, if you detach, but it, it is, it is justified theoretically. Um, it's quite a nice trick, I think. Cool. Thanks. As one one quick thing is the screen still shared. I think it is right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this plot here, um, so this is what happens when you use KL versus their objective, uh, the Vargrad objective. So one nice thing about the Vargrad objective is that because you've detached uh, the samples, or because the expectations you're taking are not with respect to the thing you're optimizing it's no longer mode seeking like reverse KL or at least not as mode seeking as reverse KL because that is really what makes reverse KL quite mode seeking. So on one side, you can see reverse KL here heavily dropping a lot of modes. Uh, these both processes are ablated, you know, with the same parameters, same initializations, everything, just different divergence. Uh, meanwhile, the, the log Vargrad uh, works pretty well uh, in terms of mode collapse. So that's another motivation for it is that it's, it's not as mode seeking as um, reverse KL, but yeah, you should read their paper uh, for that, not, not ours. <laughs> we just mentioned in passing mostly. Cool. 